I'm joined here with LA's Poet Laureate, Robin Cost Lewis. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm really honored. For people who don't know, this is sort of an obscure position. What is a Poet Laureate of a major city like Los Angeles do? Well, I think first and foremost, it's an honorific um, kind of appointment just to acknowledge the work that a poet has done. So, for example, the two poet laureates before me, Eloise Klein Healy, extraordinary poet, and Luis Rodriguez, equally extraordinary, have been writing poetry in and about LA for decades, right? I'm the baby. How I've interpreted my position as laureate um, to me is that I can visit certain events, certain communities, to talk about poetry, its importance, its history. Um, I often do readings, I also do workshops, and then I also work with older people a lot, which I love. I don't know, their memories are rich with history in a different way, and that history shows up as poetry. So basically it's a position of service, which I also love. I love thinking of myself as a public servant. Anything that's in service to people in LA who want to speak about poetry, learn about poetry, things like that, I'm pretty much there for. God goes out for whiskey Friday night, staggers back Monday morning empty-handed, no explanation. After three nights of not sleeping, three nights of listening for his footsteps, his mule sliding deftly under my bed, I stand at the stove giving him my back, wearing the same tight, tacky dress, same slip, same seam stockings I put on before he left. He leans on the kitchen table, waiting for me to make him his coffee. I watch the water boil, refuse to turn around, wonder how to leave him. Woman, he slurs, when have I ever done what you wanted me to do? There's a stereotype of L.A. just being all movie stars and sun and surf, and that's part of it, but there's yes. so much rich history here. You know, California, and specifically L.A., is one of the most diverse places in the world, not the country only, but the world. You know, we talk about diversity and inclusion now, but, you know, the part of me that's an old hag, I'm like, you don't know from diversity. Like, I lived it, you know, my high school. I went to Gardena High when it was really, really extraordinarily diverse. My friends were the children or grandchildren of people who were in the internment camps or people who were fleeing every kind of war imaginable, th imaginable throughout Asia. Uh, for me, being the poet laureate means holding all of that history in my hands so that when I step into an audience or step to a podium or step into an assisted living facility with older people and they're all people of color from all over the world and they came here during the war that I know their history so that I, I can actually talk to them with a little bit of respect and humility about the histories that have taken place here. The laureateship has been a profound way to engage several communities. Your parents are originally from Louisiana. They are, so, speaking of migrations, and, yes. And you're Creole. Afro-Creole, Afro I like to say, yeah. Okay. There, it, there are many, many, many black cultures within this country, but you would never know it by the way that we have, you know, uh, represented black culture in literature and art, which is partly why I wrote my book, mm -hmm. right? Your dad mm -hmm. was a janitor, and, he was. but he was keen on math. You know, it was one of those typical stories of families where you have too many sons, <laughs> and patriarchy being what it is, only one son could go to college. They can only afford one. Uh, to send one son. So my uncle Lucian, who was my dad's older brother, went to Howard and became a doctor and served in the army as a medic, but they couldn't afford to send my dad to college. But all his life, you know, he would sit at the table playing with math and he was a genius at it. Like he would, he tried to teach us about pi when I was in kindergarten. And people don't think about working class people um, in that way that working class people have profoundly rich intellectual lives. Right, but uh, my family certainly did, and I would even, you know, endeavor to say most working class families have rich private interior lives that we never imagined because we have such stereotypes about what it means, for example, to be a janitor. That's partly why I work so hard to make him proud. I, I will always work so hard to uh, justify what they went through and what your parents went through. I mean, what Absolutely. human beings have gone through, regardless of where we're from. I mean, the history of humanity is a profound history. You were in a San Francisco restaurant when an I accident was. happened. They had a back room and it had a hole in the ground, but they didn't tell me. 
or tell anyone. I fell down into the floor below. So I remember very little of it, but I hit my head multiple times apparently. Um, yeah, and I broke and tore and other things as well. Traumatic very, brain injury is yeah, what the doctor said. Yeah, so I have a permanent traumatic brain injury and other chronic injuries that won't ever heal. What was the recovery like? Did the doctors tell you not to do it and then after two weeks you say, forget this, I'm going back to writing, or how did that work out? I mean, I couldn't. The words were literally lifting off the page and floating around whenever I tried to read. It's hard for people to understand who don't have brain damage that that can actually happen to you. Like those words on your paper can literally move if your brain's not as healthy as it needs to be. For something like that to happen to you and then to turn it around. And I've been inspired by people who take you know tragic moments in their lives and turn them around since before long before my accident i just think that human beings are extraordinary animals and it's it's profound to watch how we do not give up we don't let me ask you this do you think you could have written that book if absolutely it was, not if it wasn't for that injury you know, my doctors told me i could write a line a day and i can read a line a day and that's how i began writing poetry because poetry is such a, a skill of metaphor. It's not just a skill of articulation. People often think that poetry is about, you know, speaking about untold stories or speaking its catharsis, speaking about untold histories. And sure, that's part of it for some people. But poetry's real gift is that you can take this incredibly vast, you know, idea or history and, and squeeze it through metaphor, down into two words if you're good. So you never wrote poetry before this? No. <laughs> I mean, yeah, sure, when I was 15 I wrote love poems, right. you know. The, just like everyone else Just like does. everyone else, right. but um, I had never written poetry seriously okay. at all. No. So you're sitting in bed and you're like, hmm, what am I gonna write about today? I know, I'm gonna look back at 30,000 or 40,000 years of art. I used the titles of artwork that included a black female figure and, um, and then I move the titles around to create a story of the history of black female representation in art. I, I understood what it meant to be a sculptor after I Absolutely. did that process. I never understood what sculptors did or how aesthetically how they relate, relate it to formlessness or a piece of rock or a huge piece of marble. But once I wrote Voyage, I understood it because I could see the project long before I actually sat down and did it. Let me ask you this, why did you pick that topic, 40,000 years of art? Why, Fantastic why that? question. So I came across this horrible poem from the 18th century that was a pro-rape poem about how to rape a black woman and to rape a white woman is exactly the same thing. Don't, we don't worry, oh great colonial rapist. It's okay if you rape a black woman. You don't need to see her if the candles are out. And th so that poem is called Voyage of a Sable Venus and then there's an etching that's also titled Voyage of the Sable Venus. The etching is heraldic. It's a beautiful image of a black woman being pulled through the waters by celestial figures and triton and cherubs and it's gorgeous. And then I look closer and, and triton is holding a flag of the Union Jack, right? So it's a, it's a pro-slavery image. That's what the image was. And I was so shocked by the history of the image, but I was equally shocked by the beauty of the title. Right? Voyage of the Sable Venus. That's a gorgeous title. And so I started to wonder about how typical it is for horrific things to be named beautiful, to, to carry beautiful names, or horrific histories to have noble names. Right? So then you got the National Book Award for Poetry. You know, I didn't know about the National Book Award really because I didn't know about poetry really. And so I just assumed that everybody got nominated because I heard there was a long list. So I thought, oh, the long list includes, includes everyone. But then when I got shortlisted, that's, i just begun my tour and that's when everything took off and, you know, it was a whole new world mm -hmm. um, of which I was very honored to be a part. See, people, I mean, I can't say no to a mayor. I can't say no to a request to be a public servant. But more importantly, I couldn't say no to doing anything for Los Angeles because I love the city so much and I think this history is so important. What has taken place here for millennia, it's just so extraordinary that I couldn't say no.